Hello world! How pro-Russian hackers sabotaged Polish trains for $20, Tor is getting an upgrade, and a famous phishing service has been shut down after its operator made some hilarious OPSEC mistakes. That's all coming up in your roundup of cybersecurity tech news. Hackers have brought down Poland's train network in a massive cyber attack. It affected trains near the city of Szczecin in northwestern Poland. Mainstream media is reporting that hackers broke into railway frequencies, and not only were 20 trains brought to a standstill, but the attackers played a recording of Russia's national anthem and a speech by President Vladimir Putin. Whilst there were no collisions and no one was hurt, it does all sound pretty dramatic, with a senior security official saying, for the moment we are ruling nothing out. And just a couple days later, it all happened again. There was another case of trains being sabotaged. So what the hell is going on here? Is this the result of some super sophisticated Kremlin-sponsored Russian cyber espionage campaign as the mainstream media is making it out to be? Well, not quite. To even call this a cyber attack is a bit of a stretch. In fact, this cyber attack is about as sophisticated as those kids on TikTok that maraud around with flipper zeros turning off TVs in department stores. The way that hack works, if we can call it a hack, is just by brute forcing all known infrared codes that are used to turn off different models of TVs. And as it turns out, Polish trains also have a remote off button that anyone can activate. It's called Radio Stop, and it allows anyone with cheap radio equipment costing just a few dollars to activate the emergency brakes on Polish trains. Radio Stop isn't a secret. Details of it are publicly available in the European Union's law directory. Just search this reference code and you'll find this document on the signalling subsystem of the Trans-European High Speed Rail System. The Radio Stop section explains that this function is typically activated by pressing a button on a train, which causes vehicle emergency braking. There are YouTube videos demonstrating that. However, it goes on to explain that when this button is pressed, a radio frequency alert is sent out, consisting of a sequence of three particular tones, F1, F2, and F3, for a duration of 100 milliseconds each in 500 millisecond intervals. And if any other trains nearby receive this warning twice, they will also apply their emergency brakes. The exact frequencies of these tones can just be found in the paragraph above, which I've blurred out so the YouTube Gestapo don't come after me. But yes, this is all public knowledge. An attacker can transmit this sequence of tones with a basic walkie-talkie that you can buy off AliExpress for less than $20. It's crazy. There's no authentication here, no encryption. As long as the tones are transmitted on the right frequencies, any trains in the area will apply their emergency brakes, pissing off passengers, but more importantly, bringing to a halt NATO's military transports, which seems to have been the motive here, given the attacker's apparent pro-Russian broadcasts. On the bright side, this attack can't be done with a flipper zero, as those things just can't transmit on the frequencies required, which, well, thank God for that. But regardless, it really doesn't take much in terms of technical skill or money to pull this off. I mean, when I read this could all be done with a cheap walkie-talkie, I thought I was being trolled. However, the main limitation of this attack is proximity. An attacker would have to be real close to a train in order to activate radio stop. Depending on the power of an attacker's radio equipment, we're talking a few hundred meters or perhaps a couple miles at best. But whoever was behind the recent attacks seems to have gone on a bit of a road trip because the disruptions occurred in three different Polish regions across the country. However, in the last couple of days, two suspects have been arrested, both Polish citizens aged 24 and 29, with radio equipment being confiscated from their home. It's unclear how they were identified, whether the signal was traced back to them, or if this is a case of them bragging on social media or something. The Polish Department of Transport is planning to deprecate the current radio communication system in favor of an authenticated cellular system, which will of course render this attack useless. But that's not going to come into effect until 2025. Until then, the problem that Radio Stop poses remains, and I don't think this is the last we'll hear of it being abused. Next up, if you've used Tor in the past year, you might have noticed it's sometimes pretty slow, and at times impossible to use. This has all been thanks to a string of DDoS campaigns that have been targeting the Tor network. In fact, earlier this year, the Tor project reported that one of these campaigns lasted seven months. We don't know who's behind it or why, but it's hard to imagine that cyber criminals are the culprit. Those guys love Tor. It's more likely the attacks are in some way state-sponsored. Regardless, DDoS attacks targeting Tor are rather effective because the network is of course designed around anonymity, so there just isn't a great way of differentiating malicious traffic from regular traffic. 
However, the Tor project has a new idea to hopefully put a stop to the DDoS attacks plaguing the network, and it's inspired by a technique described in a research paper published way back in 1992, a technique which was made famous by Bitcoin, proof of work. From now on, people wanting to use Tor will have to complete a small proof of work task to prove they're not a bot. This isn't some kind of newfangled capture, rather it's a computational task that goes on in the background, something that's easy enough for a regular CPU to complete within a reasonable amount of time, but difficult enough to prove that the computer you're connecting from likely isn't some kind of IoT device that's part of a botnet. Client side, you'll probably just see a loading screen, which, depending on Tor demand, could take anywhere from a few milliseconds to even a whole minute. Because this will all be done dynamically, the complexity of the proof of work task will automatically scale up as demand increases on the Tor network. The proof of work algorithm that's being used here is called Equix. It's designed by the same guy who developed Monero's algorithm. However, there's no cryptocurrency involved here. Nothing is being mined on your computer, which is arguably a lost opportunity for the Tor project. These guys rely on donations. They could hit two birds with one stone by making a little bit of cash on the side with this. However, there's a pretty good reason not to. A handful of countries have effectively banned cryptocurrencies altogether, so mining in the Tor browser could give them a pretty good excuse to treat even a whiff of Tor traffic as a financial crime. There are downsides to using proof of work as a kind of anti-DDoS mechanism. It might make using Tor on mobile devices pretty tedious, as their limited computing power of course means the proof of work challenge will take quite a bit longer than it will on a computer. Also, this isn't going to stop DDoS attacks once and for all. It's thought that whilst this will be effective against script kiddies and small botnets, when it comes to attackers with deep pockets and those armed with really large botnets, they will still be able to make a dent in the Tor network but hopefully less of a dent than they've been able to inflict up until now. Next up, you probably haven't heard of them, but chances are you've seen their emails. 16shop is a notorious phishing platform, which has for years made it incredibly easy for newbie cybercriminals to create realistic landing pages which impersonate a variety of brands. And it's just been shut down by Interpol, after its creator made a whole series of hilarious OPSEC mistakes. So 16shop acted as a kind of website builder, but for phishing attacks. A cyber bad guy would select the brand they want to impersonate, customize the phishing email they want to blast out, as well as the highly realistic landing pages, the language of which would even be automatically changed based on the victim's geolocated IP. And after victims had entered their personal information, it would all be exfiltrated straight to the 16shop customer, who'd be paying in some cases just $60 a month for access to the platform. 16shop had become so well known amongst cyber bad guys that some cyber criminals even created pirated versions of it, but they came with a hidden back door, siphoning off any collected information to the pirates via telegram. As for the real 16 shop, it's been around since 2017, but the question of who's behind it is a little complicated. The service was originally run by someone going by the name Devil Scream, and his obsec sucked. One of his silly mistakes that ultimately led to his demise was accidentally leaving his personal Gmail address in 16 shop source code as a placeholder. He also, and this is kind of unbelievable, he documented the development of 16shop on his Instagram story. I mean, if you look closely at the code, you can see references to a fake American Express login page. Security researchers, of course, subsequently identified the true identity of Devil Scream, a 21-year-old Indonesian guy who was apparently a member of the cybercrime group, the Indonesian Cyber Army. The guy was then arrested and imprisoned, but 16shop remained online. The site was now being run by two of his friends, who it seems have now been arrested themselves, with Indonesian police seizing several luxury vehicles in the process, proving it is still possible to become rich as a freelance web designer. Interpol estimates that since 2017, the service has been used to compromise over 70,000 users, but that's likely to be a severe understatement, because 16shop was incredibly popular. The cybersecurity company Group IB, which actually helped Interpol shut them down, reports that over 150,000 phishing domains were created using 16shop. It's hard to overstate just how big of a problem phishing really is. It's thought that 90% of breaches start with just a single phishing email. Even some of the highest profile data breaches we've seen, like the Colonial Pipeline hack, which led to literal fuel shortages, are thought to have started with a solitary phishing email. If you happen to be in need of web hosting, but the legit kind, then today's sponsor can help you out with that. 
Akamai Connected Cloud is your Swiss Army knife for cloud computing. These guys can handle everything cloud, and they're giving you a $100 60-day credit just to get started. One of their features that I love is their app marketplace, which makes it super easy to spin up servers with pre-configured software. Need an instance of Kali? Just configure the basics with their installer and you're done. So click the link in the description now to claim your free $100 credit. As always, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Have a good one.